Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. It's Thursday, January 13, 2022. I'm Ash Bennington, joined shortly by Katie Stockton, founder and managing partner of Fairfield Strategies. Welcome, Katie. Thanks so much, Ash. Good to be with you. Before we jump into the conversation, here's what's happening in markets right now. Ugly day, especially on the NASDAQ. Looks like still bouncing around a little bit, uh, but off 2.51% I see here on my screen. Looks like getting settled around 14,806. Uh, Dow, S&P, Russell 2000, all turn negative on the day. Uh, quite an unpleasant day, but great to have you here, Katie, so you can give us your analysis of everything that's happening. A fun day to have you on, certainly, in terms of understanding how you're looking at these markets. This is the first time you and I have done a show together. Tell us a little bit about what you do and how you see the world. Well, thanks for asking. So I, I'm a technical analyst, and I'm really very much a purist in that sense. I only look at charts. I'm only looking at price as it pertains to the supply and demand for various securities. I publish strategy research for clients and subscribers, and we focus primarily on U.S. equities, but we also look at what I consider to be macro technicals, things like 10-year Treasury yields and gold and crude oil and the dollar. Um, and we've added a couple of products focused on crypto and cannabis, and we do some sector deep dives. Uh, so we really cover a lot of ground with our research, and we're looking for opportunities first and foremost, but we're also trying to help our clients manage risk. So I think the charts are really um, just so designed for that and that we can identify key levels, things like support and resistance levels. And also we have indicators that take out some of the emotion of trading and investing and help us understand when risk might be heightened. A day like today, of course, I call it the inverse property of technical analysis, like demand for my services goes up when the market goes down. So I'm hearing a lot more from my subscribers today than, than usual. Um, but so it goes, and we just try to help them navigate the volatility. Yeah, as I said at the top of the show, a great day to have you here. Much to get into. We'll talk about all that and more. But first, at the top of the show, I wanted to queue up a conversation between our co-founder and CEO, Rao Pal, and Julian Brigden of Macro Intelligence Two Partners. A very relevant conversation. This piece comes to us from the pro, uh, from the from the Real Vision Pro tier, Pro Macro Insiders Talks for January. Let's take a look at the clip. So I think the biggest risk to the bond market is really in uh, the tip sector, which has been, you know, this inflation hedges, because I think either, I think there is a chance, I wrote to my pro client, my professional clients, I said institutional clients yesterday that I thought maybe the CPI number could peak. Uh, I was wrong this month, but I think it's coming in the next few months that so the headline rate will peak. So that'll take some of the oomph out of tips. Um, and I also think that as the Fed starts to tighten rates, that will also take some of the oomph out of tips. And this is where a lot of the money has been hiding. Like people have hidden in the bond market, um, in the tip sector. And it's also part and parcel of, I think, a broader theme where I think if I look at 2022, I'm thinking really that, you know, to use that biblical expression, the last will come first and the first will become last. So the trades that have worked extraordinarily well for the last year or so start to reverse. And, you know, you're seeing some signs of that in like growth value. But it's only embryonic, but I think start to reverse hard in 2022. Well, there you have it, a bit about macro, talking about CPI and tips. But Katie, something that's right in your wheelhouse, Julian ends on this note, uh, the last will come first and the first will become last. Uh, do you see a broad risk reversal in the types of trades uh, that have been working so far? Yeah, and I guess so far, if we draw that back to the COVID low in 2020, I'd say yes, we have certainly seen some kind of shift when you're looking at, say, as an example, defensive sectors and them having picked up a little bit of relative strength of late over the past two months or so. So I would consider that to be one sort of risk off type of shift. We're seeing it also in terms of market breadth or participation, and that means the number of stocks that are up on up days and down on down days, and that measure 
peaked sometime towards the middle part of last year, and we've seen a more trading range environment unfold for market breadth, even though the major indices have been trading higher. So that's created a more difficult environment, and that more difficult environment is more likely a maturing uptrend. We don't have a lot of pressing near-term sell signals, uh, but definitely something to keep an eye on. We don't put a lot of weight into market cycles. We feel that it's a very difficult thing to leverage. But listen, there's definitely some truth to the fact that if you had a winning sector, as one example, last year, well, chances are pretty good it's not going to be the winner again this year. So we always keep an open mind as to those sector rotations. We know that the markets tend to be very rotational in nature, and that doesn't even just go for the stock market, but asset classes. So there's some real rotations out there that we can leverage for sure. Yeah, well said. We're going to dive in and dig into those asset classes in just a minute here. But first, before we get into the details, I want to give you the opportunity just to give a broad context on what you see here today. I know it's a bit challenging. You've been uh, in front of the camera here as we've been uh, coming into the close. Uh, but give us a sense of what we see on a day like today. Obviously, some pr pretty significant downturns, particularly in tech stocks. What are you thinking about it, and how do you contextualize it? Yeah, I have gotten that question a couple times already, as you can imagine, and it really just makes me uh, feel like the tape is somewhat fragile. It's been something we've been saying for the past week or so, maybe even the past two weeks, in that we've seen that loss of market breadth or participation, and then we had that high growth corrective phase uh, you know, that started late last year. All of that taken together to show some, I guess, fragility to the market, and, and today is certainly exemplary of that. Today's action takes the NASDAQ 100 index as one benchmark back below a support level that we've been watching. So we always make sure any kind of breakdowns are confirmed, though, and, and by that we mean a couple of days, a couple of closes below a key level. Our key level is 15,575 for the NASDAQ 100. It did close below. So we would need to see a subsequent close below again tomorrow to then confirm that short-term breakdown. We've already seen some short-term breakdowns, as you can imagine, in technology more broadly, including for Microsoft, including for Google, which, of course, have a pretty big footprint in the NASDAQ 100 and the S&P 500 as well. So these are all kind of chinks in the armor of the market. And uh, we, we moved to a neutral long-term bias in October. Uh, and yet we are short-term bullish still here. The reason being our indicators on the monthly charts, looking at the long-term gauges that we follow, we did start to see some signs of exhaustion starting around September and October. And now they're even more pressing, having unfolded in more benchmarks. As an example, the NASDAQ 100 has a new sell signal for the DeMarc indicators, if you know of uh, Tom DeMarc's work. There's a new sell signal based on one of his models this month for the NASDAQ 100. We already have active signals of that nature for the S&P 500. We have a monthly MACD sell signal, a momentum sell signal effectively for the Russell 2000 index. So all of that, it does create that backdrop that's a, just a bit more of a difficult tape. Yeah, MACD, of course, moving average convergence divergence uh, indicator. Uh, you talked about the key support level that you saw breached on uh, on on the Nasdaq today, uh, and waiting for a confirmation of that. Give us a sense of what that means. How do you know when that's been confirmed, and if it has been confirmed, what does it foretell in your model? Yeah, it's, so for me, and I think everyone's different, right? What what they should require, what they do require for um, a breakout or breakdown to look decisive, and we just find that to to create some kind of time qualifier tends to be a good idea because you often get whipsaws, right? Whipsaws or shakeouts. And uh, that tends to be associated with emotional trading, of which you could certainly assign that to this afternoon's trading. Uh, so we make sure that we see the two closes below. So today would be one, tomorrow could be another, to confirm a short-term breakdown or breakout. And then on a more intermediate-term level, we'd look for two weekly closes below or above a key level. So it just depends on the time frame that we have in mind. And, and even if you're looking at intraday charts, a day trader might look at a 60-minute bar and say, I need two hours above a level or below a level to confirm. So I think that time filter is really very helpful, and it's helped us avoid 
yeah. those, those kind of shakeouts, which is essentially a false breakdown uh, below various support levels, of which they're very, very common. Um, you know, sometimes it, it seems like it's just because so many people are watching a key support level, and all of a sudden you see a bit of a flurry of activity around a level, and yet we never see that confirmation of a breakdown, breakout, because buyers are stepping in. And also, we have to think about support and resistance levels not as precise points. There's just too many market participants out there to let that be the case, um, but rather cushions. So you think of them as something that we can come down to, dip, blow, intraday, intraweek, whatever it may be, and still find that support roughly in that area. Yeah. So we've just talked a little bit about NASDAQ. Let's turn uh, here to S&P 500. Uh, so it looks like it's off. Uh, I'm looking at my terminal here. It looks like off uh, on the uh, year to date, uh, minus 2.3%. That said, up almost 23%, just a shy of 23% on a 20 on a 12 month trailing basis. Give us your sense of what your thoughts are for S&P 500. The long-term momentum behind S&P 500 and also just the major indices outside of the Russell 2000 is still to the upside, but it's definitely waned or fallen off since that kind of October time frame, at which time we saw the overbought sell signals start to develop. So we've seen a downtick in long-term momentum. That in and of itself is not a breakdown. Um, we certainly don't have a breakdown in the S&P 500 at current levels, uh, but it is something that we'd be really wary of because we have those signs of upside exhaustion. And these are measurable things. So when we say something is overbought, it's something that we're saying from a mathematical perspective. It's when those overbought conditions actually yield downturns in our indicators, things like the stochastic oscillator for one. That's where we start to say, okay, now is the time to put on hedges. We like to look at those stochastics for daily, weekly, and monthly bar charts, so to get that coverage of short-term, intermediate-term, and long-term. And for the S&P 500, the level that's equivalent to that 50, 15,575 for the NASDAQ 100 is roughly 4546, and it's based on a previous resistance level and also approximates short-term support by a couple other measures as well. Below these levels, the next support, at least as of two days ago, was about, I'd say, 8 to 10 percent below. So what we can do is, is look at the secondary support level as a gauge of potential downside risk in the event of a breakdown. It doesn't mean that benchmarks have to go straight down to that level. Maybe you'll get an oversold bounce first, and we'll try to help our clients navigate that. You know, do, do I wait for the selling opportunity? Do I sell into the weakness? That type of question we try to help them answer. Uh, but, but the increased risk does dictate some kind of hedging if and when we get these confirmed breakdowns or just a reduction in exposure. Maybe you want to get more defensive, uh, increase your gold exposure, increase your exposure to cash equivalents or, um, you know, treasuries if you're so inclined. Uh, so, so there's just ways to kind of navigate that. And the, the support levels, you know, we, we never recommend buy stop orders. We never say, okay, S&P 500 at, you know, 4,200, that's where you want to buy. Um, we can say with some level of confidence that we, we have a sense that it should bottom at or above that level, uh, but not until we see the turnaround in the indicators to the upside will we feel confident that we have an entry point at hand. So we rely not only on the levels for a gauge of risk, but also on our indicators. Yeah. So, Katie, we've been talking about these markets uh, principally, in fact, exclusively from the context of technical uh, levels, technical trading, technical analysis. Obviously, the big stories over the last two days uh, have been uh, CPI inflation peaking at around 7 percent. This is the highest in 40 years uh, and some murmuring. Uh, from Federal Reserve officials, uh, particularly uh, Loretta Meester from the Cleveland Fed, uh, president of the Cleveland Fed, I should say, uh, and Raphael Bostic at the Atlantic Fed, president of that uh, bank, uh, who are talking about the need to potentially signal rate hikes as soon as March. How do these types of macro signals play into your models, if at all? Well, and I, I don't really have models per se, but rather the technical indicators. And, and what I care most about is, is market sentiment coming into these types of potential events, right? If, if the markets are characterized by extreme greed, which we have ways to measure, then that 
creates an environment that's very ripe for a correction and vice versa. If folks are really bearish coming into a Fed meeting, uh, then of course it tees up for a relief rally of sort once that news finally is absorbed by the marketplace. So we, we think about it more in terms of market sentiment. A couple ways to measure that would be using the fear and greed index. It's a pretty popular gauge offered online, and it incorporates seven different components that are reflective of how folks are positioned. Are they exposed to junk bonds? You know, what are high-low um, relationships telling us? That type of thing. Put call ratios. Uh, those can tell us if people are positioned in a way that they feel really confident in the market or not so much. And then also the VIX or the volatility index which I consider to be like a transactional gauge of market sentiment. When the VIX rises, especially if it's spiking, that, of course, is associated with increased downside volatility for the major indices. So we give a lot of weight to the volatility index, and we're expecting the VIX to clear a resistance level. It's just below 28. Um, of course, we're hoping to get ahead of that breakout um, in terms of the, the S&P 500 call. Uh, but if we do see that level cleared, it would suggest that we have gotten out of this like low volatility cycle that I think has characterized the market for more than several months. If you look at the VIX, it does have sort of a cyclicality to it. And when you get these big spikes above key levels, the last time we really saw this uh, based on the model that I'm looking at or the indicator that I'm looking at was early 2018. So it would put us in that kind of environment where, like, if you recall in 2017, we saw a nice move for the market into that period, a, a good sort of prolonged, not parabolic, but nice deep solid uptrend uh, that was then followed by these same sell signals that we have now. And then that VIX climbed above a key threshold and got us into what was a more range band environment overall for 2018. But within that range, we had two pretty major corrective phases. So it just required a bit more risk management and more attention to the short and intermediate term indicators. So we suspect that we could be getting into that environment. But as it pertains to those macro types of events, we really give a lot of weight to market sentiment and always adhering to momentum indicators and support and resistance levels to judge reactions. I'd say almost the same thing would apply when we get into earnings season. The charts aren't going to add any value or color as it pertains to anything fundamental uh, or related. But what we can at least judge is, is whether something's running into an earnings report somewhat hot, i.e. financials, um, or is it coming into the, uh, an earnings report more oversold, which would tee it up for a relief rally. We can look at market history and see how the past reactions have unfolded for that name in particular. Uh, but earnings season, as we all know, does tend to create a little bit of uh, volatility typically. So I think this time will be no different. Yeah. I'm curious at your thoughts. You mentioned bonds in there. Let's talk a little bit about cost of capital, U.S. 10-year Treasury yield. Uh, I think just as we were speaking here, dip below 1.7 on a yield basis. Uh, what are your thoughts on the 10-year Treasury note, uh, and how are you looking at it? If I could, I'm, I'll share a chart on this one. Uh, let me see if I can find how to do this. And share screen. Okay. So I think the, the charts sometimes speak louder than my words, as you can imagine. Um, and as mentioned, you did see a pullback today in yield terms. Uh, but the thought here on 10-year Treasury yields, which are loading on my terminal here slowly, is that we'll expect some short-term consolidation over the next week or two. Um, and it's a very natural place for that to happen. Because if you look at this weekly bar chart, there is a resistance level. It's roughly 179. It's based on a 50% Fibonacci retracement level. And it also approximates the high from last year. It's a very natural place for this steep up move that we saw at the start of the year to take pause. So we're, we are looking for some consolidation. Uh, but notice here that this shaded area on the chart, this is called the cloud model. And this is showing that 10-year Treasury yields are in a gradual uptrend. It's providing support repeatedly. And our intermediate term gauge, as you see here on the chart, something called the weekly stochastic oscillator, that's pointing higher. And if you look at the uh, trustee MACD, that's also pointing higher. So those intermediate term gauges suggest that we will get through that uh, 179 resistance level following some short-term consolidation. And then um, in following with looking at a secondary level as a gauge of downside, we do the same on the upside. And secondary resistance for 10-year Treasury yields is about 2.13%. 
and that is based on another Fibonacci retracement level. It certainly would seem attainable if we get that breakout, which we are looking for. So is that a cloud model uh, with an overlay uh, of DeMarc indicators against Fibonacci bars? Is that what we're saying? <laughs> That's right. You make it sound more complicated than I feel like it is. But yes, <laughs> it's, the, <laughs> it's the Ichimoku or cloud model. You see some of the DeMarc indicators and signals in here. Last big uh, so-called buy signal was here pretty timely. Uh, if you live through this move and uh, with the stochastic oscillator. And then we have another chart of which we have a different DeMarc indicator, a series of moving averages, and the MACD indicator with the histogram. So this is a very common sort of chart template for us to use as we analyze uh, any kind of security. Give us a sense for people who aren't familiar with these moving average convergence divergence, what it means and why it's significant in your view in terms of price action. It's all about eliminating noise and isolating important trend shifts. I think we're at the point with all the software out there, the very robust charting programs for very low cost <laughs> that, that, that's available to us. We can all really judge what the prevailing trends are. The hard part is to understand when they're reversing and when it's more than just noise. So that's what we really rely upon uh, from the MACD, which is a spread between two exponential moving averages of price. And that, that spread is then smoothed by another moving average to get a, a so-called signal line. So the blue is the data line, the red is the signal line, and the crossovers to us are most informational. When you have a crossover, it's signifying an important trend shift over whatever time horizon you're looking at, which in this case, I would call it intermediate term because we have a weekly bar chart pulled up. And then the histogram can show you some expansions and, and, and contractions in momentum um, as a trend progresses. And that can be informational too, just as a great case in point. Mm. Still had downside momentum here based on the MACD, but notice it was ticking higher, higher, higher before finally uh, going into positive territory. So we definitely get some nuances from that histogram. And I think it's a fantastic way to eliminate the noise around these turning points and to make sure that uh, momentum is, is basically on our side. Just like any indicator, of course, it has an inherent lag to it. It is based on moving averages of price, which are looking back over history. Um, and yet we can navigate that by using some more sensitive indicators, either on shorter term timeframes or using things like these DeMarc indicators. Katie, what are the durations of those moving averages is that you're measuring the ratio against when you look at those crosses? Um, on the MACD or on the, the moving averages here? Uh, well, both, but I was thinking about MACD. It's a spread between a 26 period and a 12 period, typically. So some people don't use the standard parameters, uh, but 26 to 12. And then the smoothing is usually a nine period moving average. And, uh, you know, I, I believe it's funny because those parameters tend to re reappear in other technical indicators. The one included would be the cloud model or a Chimoku. And I think it probably is the case because of the market calendar. Um, it's, it's just something that probably tested well um, over history and it has some derivation from the market calendar, why those parameters tend to um, you know, be helpful for folks. And so we're very perfectly happy using the standard parameters. I think the key takeaway is that you need to go back to the same indicators. You can't sort of manipulate them as you go to, to and then you get that confirmation bias, right? Looking at something that's, uh, you know, doesn't quite suit what your thoughts are and then you tighten it up and say, ah, okay, there it is. Um, so to prevent that confirmation bias, you, you can just, you know, come back to the same parameters every time. And I think that's where you get some value from these uh, mathematical gauges, which really can um, take a, out a lot of the biases of the market. I know we're getting low on time here, but I wanted to hit a couple of other assets. I'm curious, uh, talking about places where we've seen some volatility, I'm looking at a 12-month chart right now on CL1. This is WTI, uh, Feb 22 contracts. What are you seeing in oil and in the energy complex more broadly? Yeah, and we, we publish on oil weekly and, of course, focus as well on the energy sector and its relative strength and look for opportunities there. And, and certainly there have been a lot of opportunities. It's one of the few sources of breakouts. Uh, WTI crude oil, if you look here on the generic contract, has come right up into resistance based on 
previous highs in here. This the generic shows the resistance around 85, uh, but if you look at the front month, it's a it's closer to 82, 83, and this is a proving ground for crude oil. So if we could see a decisive breakout by however you de define that, and uh, for us it's a couple good solid closes above, that breakout would catalyze upside follow through in our opinion, and uh, and yet the targeted level from that, if you use what we call a measured move projection, it's pretty um, conservative. For the front month, I think it was something like 84 or 85. So not as uh, impressive in terms of upside potential as your average breakout, and that's just a function of how deep the correction before this move began uh, was, and also the strength of the relief rally. So a lot of the short-term move has, I think, been baked into some of these stocks, which are now starting to show some signs of short-term upside exhaustion. So I would say the takeaway is that you know that crude oil prices are at a proving ground here. A breakout would be positive, but only modestly positive based on target targeted levels. We sense that crude oil, like the equity market, might get into a bit more of a range-bound environment this year, uh, similar to uh, our, our comments as it pertains to the long-term indicators. As, as one example, on the monthly crude oil chart here, you see a downturn in the stochastics after it had been elevated for some time, and the last time that happened was late 2018. Yeah. Katie, I know we're running low on time here, but I want to get to one question uh, at least. This one comes to us from Jeff B. from YouTube. Uh, and the question is, would love to hear Katie's thoughts on bonds, which we've heard about, and the dollar in this environment, which we haven't. Katie, what are your thoughts on the dollar? You know, we just started commenting on this this morning in our morning note um, to clients. And the dollar index has upheld positive intermediate term momentum for some time. As it loads here, I'll show you on the weekly MACD, it's been positive since June um, until this week, or really until just a couple of days ago. So we, we do have a pending short-term breakdown in the, the dollar index, and you can see the impact is uh, negative on this weekly MACD indicator. The crossover, assuming it's there at the close tomorrow of the week, that would suggest that the dollar is at least getting into more of a range bound type of situation here, as opposed to maintaining this nice uptrend as it has been. So we're looking for a greater loss of momentum behind the dollar index. And the level that we were watching as resistance in part is this 96.1 kind of area based on the monthly cloud. Uh, that has been a bit of a hurdle as it seems. So uh, we do think that we'll see more dollar weakness before it gets out of this kind of consolidation mode. Support for the dollar index is roughly 93.4. And with that, we've gotten a little bit of outperformance from emerging markets for a change. Yeah, and if you can't see that Y axis, it looks like 94 spot 87 on DXY right now. Obviously, not a great couple of days for dollar index. Uh, Katie, as we come to the close here of this conversation, final thoughts, key takeaways that you'd like to leave our viewers with. Oh, gosh. Well, I would just say, um, you know, be very mindful of any breakdowns that occur. Our message is to, um, for the most part, keep an eye on that VIX and then also keep an eye on market breadth or participation as evidence in the, the cumulative advanced decline line, which hopefully is available pretty easily um, online. We don't want to see a breakout in the VIX and a breakdown in cumulative breadth because that would tell us we've gotten into uh, what is no longer really categorized as an uptrend um, going back to early 2020, but rather a more difficult range band environment like 2018. So I think that's a key thing to watch. And then with that, if we get that kind of situation, then gold might be something that folks want to have a look at. If you see gold, it's a long-term triangle formation at this time. Triangles tend to be really high probability technical price patterns. So if we got a breakout in gold, and I think the resistance is around 1860, so not far, uh, that would be a pretty major development from a long-term perspective to consider. Katie, this was great, especially walking through those charts. Thanks again for joining us. Really enjoyed this. Of course. And thanks again for watching Real Vision Daily Briefing. Maggie will be here tomorrow with Raoul. As always, the conversation continues on Real Vision's The Exchange. Thanks for watching, everybody.